to the Freeman Heights Baptist Church family and to those who are viewing by way of YouTube. Thanks be unto God for this great privilege that he's given us to once again go into his word as God would reveal himself, his way and his will for our lives. I'm so excited about our study on the Ten Commandments. This week, we're going to be addressing the second commandment, which is found in Exodus 20, beginning at verse four. I'd ask that you would turn in your Bibles or go to your device and read along with me as we look at Exodus, the 20th chapter, verses four through six. It reads, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. I've read for your hearing and edification, Exodus, the 20th chapter, verses four through six. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearers, but most especially the doers of his holy and inspired word. Let us pray together. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we are so grateful and thankful for the privilege that you've given us once again to come before you. We just pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior that you would take this, your humble servant, hide me behind the cross, that I would in fact decrease, that you would increase, that Jesus would be lifted up, lives would be transformed and changed as a result of the word of God. It's in the sweet and precious name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen, amen, amen. We've been studying the Ten Commandments, and the first commandment that we studied was dealing with who we worship who we worship. And now as we look at this second commandment, it addresses how we worship, how we worship. It's so important. And as we go through the text today, we're going to see that worship and our worship of God is so important. How we worship is so important. So as we go into this commandment, let's just think about and ask yourself, how is your worship of a great and living God? How do you worship him? Are you worshiping him each and every day and on all things that you do? We're going to examine in the text that God is expecting us to worship him in a certain manner and a certain way. And he starts off the text by reminding us we are not to worship. We are to worship him. We are to worship him, not an image or an idol. Worship him, not an image or an idol. Idols and images are man's idea of who God is. Idols and images are fashioned by the hands of man based on what their experiences are, based off their thoughts, based off our, our own imaginations or our own opinions. In other words, an, an idol or an image is a representation of God as man sees it, as man sees it. We should work up, worship him and him alone. In, in the Bible, students will recall in Exodus 32, Israel quickly disobeys this commandment when they made a golden calf. They wanted a God like the nations around them had. They wanted a God they could see and touch and, and be sovereign over. Although they were making it in the image of the true and living God, they made a golden calf. Nevertheless, it was an image of God. They were trying to make a image of God. They wanted to be like the other nations. They could see and touch and, 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 and they wanted to feel and know that God is. But our faith in our God realizes it's not what things that we see, but it's the things that are not seen that are critical to a child of God. No, we're not to make an image of me, the Bible says, referring to God. So this prohibition clearly extends both to images of others' gods as well as trying to make an image of the living true God. The reason that God forbids us from worshiping an idol or an image is God had decided how he would reveal himself to man. You see, man cannot does not have the capacity or the ability to truly reveal who God is and the character and nature of God. So God in his wisdom and sovereignty decided to reveal himself by the Bible. The Bible is God revealing himself to man. 
God has chosen the Bible as his self-revelation, his revealing himself in the Bible. In other words, God gave us the Bible so that we could come to know him for ourselves as he revealed himself to us like only he can. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, he in fact will reveal himself to us to the word of God, not through a statue, not through an image, not to gold, not to an image, but the word of God himself. God reveal himself to us. And my brothers and sisters, I can tell you today, when God reveals himself through the word of God and you've experienced a relationship with God, it's a life-changing experience. But now, this command does not forbid us from all art or sculpture, because you can remember that the tabernacle had the cherubim over the ark of the covenant. Now, Christians have disagreed whether it's uh, permissible or not to have a picture or something that's representing. The key is that we should not be worshiping or serving. There's nothing wrong with beautiful art or paintings, but we should not be worshiping a picture of Jesus. People have pictures of Jesus. We have white Jesus, black Jesus, brown Jesus, yellow Jesus, but we should not be worshiping a picture. We should be worshiping our Lord and Savior. He clearly says you shall not worship them or serve them. Praying to a statue or a picture is a violation of the second commandment. And right there in that fifth verse, we see that God reveals a part of his nature of who he is by saying he is a jealous God. Now, that opens up a whole bag of problems for most of us because we're told not to be jealous or envious of others. We normally think of jealousy as a sinful human emotion. I mean, we're not supposed to be jealous, are we? Of course not. Does that mean that God actually has an emotion in him that corresponds to our jealousy? No, God is saying, I am similar to the situation of like a husband or a wife. And his spouse has cheated on them. The, the spouse has been disobedient to him. How would that make the spouse feel? How would that make a husband feel if his wife was not faithful? How would a wife feel if her husband was not faithful? God is reminding us in similar to a marriage relationship that God can be jealous. And he means by, and what we mean by jealous is we have entered into a covenant relationship in marriage. We take vows and make vows between one another in marriage to be faithful to one another. As we enter into a relationship with our great God, who is a covenant making God and covenant keeping God, we enter into covenant with God that we would worship him and worship him alone in the way in which he dictates. So we need to understand God looks at jealousy as anything that is reserved, any kind of worship or any kind of service. And what I mean by service, service of spiritual nature or worshiping anything is reserved for God. Your worship is reserved for God. And we see also in our text that it God not only revealed a part of his nature, not only did he reveal the, how he would reveal himself and how we should worship, because it's all in the word of God of how we should worship. We should be singing praises and prayers and, and doing those things that are commanded of God in worship. He's dictated all those things of how we should worship him. But he also identifies in our text the results of worship. Those can be either bad or good according to the word of God. Depending on our obedience and, and faithfulness to the covenant, we can see the result of worship. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We must worship him in spirit and in truth. And, and we need to understand that when we talk about worshiping him in spirit and in truth, we're saying as it is dictated in the word of God. And my brothers and sisters, if there can be worship in spirit and truth, that also leads us to there can be false worship. There can be idol worship. And there is a warning that is provided for us 
having another God and worshiping another God. It's in the text right there. We read it. But we also can see from 1 Samuel 5 and 6, this is recorded in the Holy Writ. Now the hand of the Lord was heavy on the Ashdots, Ashdites, excuse me, and he ravaged them and smote them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territories. Well, when we elevate anything to the place of God, we will find out too late that it is a terrible thing to put something before a living and great God. The, uh, in 1 Samuel, the first five verses of that text, you Bible uh, readers will know and recognize that the Philistines had taken possession of the Ark of the Covenant, had taken it from Ebenezer to uh, Ashdod, placed it next to their God, the Philistine little G God, Dagon, in his temple. They placed the Ark of the Covenant being representation of God's presence next to their little G O D. My brothers and sisters, when you read those first five verses of 1 Samuel, the fifth chapter, and I would encourage you to do that, you'll find out that when they brought in the Ark of the Covenant, the next day they came in, their God was laying flat on the ground. And then these <laughs> men, these Philistines, picked up the idol God, Dagon, and placed him back up. And the next day when they came back in, not only had Dagon fallen down, but his hands and his heads had been removed. Why? Signifying to the people that nothing, no one, no image, no idol can stand or be compared to the God, the true and living God that we serve. We should only serve him and not have any other God or image in our life. And as you continue to read that text, when you continue to read in 1 Samuel, here's what you find out. They, that whole city and its territory were plagued with tumors. It then goes on to say that the temple today is still plagued. People will not step on that threshold because of the tumors that existed all of those generations ago. In fact, it was so bad, the people of God cried out saying, what must we do? And they ultimately realized that they had to give God his rightful place of worship. And each one of you, my brothers and sisters who are listening under to the sound of my voice, it is my prayer that you come to the conclusion. For those of you who don't know God, a living and true God for yourself, that you would come to the conclusion that you need a relationship with God Almighty, the true God. They came to that conclusion, but they had suffered as a result how many times do we suffer and it takes place because people are not worshiping or being obedient to God? In fact, in the text, it says that this, 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 this curse or this uh, can happen to the third or the fourth generation. The impact of disobedience can have a negative impact, impact on generations to generation. Now, that's not saying that God will punish the children for the parents' sins. What he is saying and what it does mean is many times because parents have sinned, because parents have been disobedient and out of a covenant relationship with God or acting in a way that's disobedient to the covenant, that the children are impacted by the environment in which they are living. Oh, 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 uh, unfortunately, I have counseled and given spiritual guidance to so many men and women who have been abused as children. Those have been abused, spouses who've been abused, and they see that the parents, the, the abuser themselves was abused when they were young. Now, you and I would both think that if something bad and tragic had happened to us, we would safeguard and make sure that that wouldn't happen to another generation. But it's quite contrary. That, that environment that is placed on the children has a tendency to be uh, replicated through generation after generation. And it's not God, it was the sin, the unconfessed sin. Oh, but I'm thankful to God that there is a way to break that vicious cycle. And that's by trusting in your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, going to the word of God and allowing God to reveal his way and will for your life. And if we are obedient to that and do God's will, we can receive a blessing. Well, Let's go back to our next uh, point. Not only does God uh, 
have a curse or negative things that happen as a result of not worshiping him properly. We're also told there are blessings for those that love him and keep his commandments. The 59th number of Psalms says, my God in loving kindness will meet me. My God will let me look triumphantly upon my foes. My brothers and sisters, I want to close this message today by reminding you a true worship of the true God is a blessing to you and your children if you will just understand how much God loves you. He loves you so much that while we were in our sins, Christ died for us, shed his blood. And by accepting the shed blood, we enter into a covenant with Jesus Christ. And the moment we do that, we are saved and on our way to heaven, not because of something we've done, but because of the price that was paid by Jesus Christ on the cross. Thank you. We need to recognize and understand that God wants to enter into a loving covenant relationship with you. Yes, you, regardless of what you've done in the past, regardless of the things that have happened in your life, God is a healer, a loving God, and a trusting God. Trust him and trust him alone. Our gracious and heavenly father, we thank you so much for your word. We recognize your commandments are not to restrict us, but to help us. We understand that your word has been given to us to set us free from bondage and those things that are holding us hostage. We pray in the precious name of Jesus that your word would go back and not return void. It's in his name, Jesus' name we pray, amen. It is my prayer that God would bless you and keep you.